Last and First Men, A Story of the Near and Far Future, by Olaf Stapleton. Preface. This is a work of fiction. I have tried to invent a story which may seem a possible, or at least not wholly impossible, account of the future of man, and I have tried to make that story relevant to the change that is taking place today in man's outlook. To romance of the future may seem to be indulgence in ungoverned speculation for the sake of the marvellous, yet controlled imagination in this sphere can be a very valuable exercise for minds bewildered about the present and its potentialities. Today we should welcome and even study every serious attempt to envisage the future of our race, not merely in order to grasp the very diverse and often tragic possibilities that confront us, but also that we may familiarise ourselves with the certainty that many of our most cherished ideals would seem puerile to more developed minds. To romance of the far future, then, is to attempt to see the human race in its cosmic setting and to mould our hearts to entertain new values. But if such imaginative construction of possible futures is to be at all potent, our imagination must be strictly disciplined. We must endeavour not to go beyond the bounds of possibility set by the particular state of culture within which we live. The merely fantastic has only minor power, not that we should seek actually to prophesy what will, as a matter of fact, occur, for in our present state such prophecy is certainly futile, save in the simplest matters. We are not to set up as historians attempting to look ahead instead of backwards. We can only select a certain thread out of the tangle of many equally valid possibilities, but we must select with a purpose. The activity that we are undertaking is not science, but art, and the effect that it should have on the reader is the effect that art should have. Yet our aim is not merely to create aesthetically admirable fiction. We must achieve neither mere history nor mere fiction, but myth. A true myth is one which, within the universe of a certain culture, living or dead, expresses richly, and often perhaps tragically, the highest admirations possible within that culture. A false myth is one which either violently transgresses the limits of credibility set by its own cultural matrix, or expresses admirations less developed than those of its culture's best vision. This book can no more claim to be true myth than true prophecy, but it is an essay in myth creation. The kind of future that is here imagined should not, I think, seem wholly fantastic, or at any rate not so fantastic as to be without significance to modern Western individuals who are familiar with the outlines of contemporary thought. Had I chosen matter in which there was nothing whatever of the fantastic, its very plausibility would have rendered it unplausible. For one thing, at least, is almost certain about the future, namely that very much of it shall be such as we should call incredible. In one important respect, indeed, I may perhaps seem to have strayed into barren extravagance. I have supposed an inhabitant of the remote future to be communicating with us of today. I have pretended that he has the power of partially controlling the operation of minds now living, and that this book is the product of such influence. Yet even this fiction is perhaps not wholly excluded by our thought. I might, of course, easily have omitted it without more than superficial alteration of the theme, but its introduction was more than a convenience. Only by some such radical and bewildering device could I embody the possibility that there may be more in time's nature than is revealed to us. Indeed, only by some such trick could I do justice to the conviction that our whole present mentality is but a confused and halting first experiment. If ever this book should happen to be discovered by some future individual, for instance, by a member of the next generation sorting out the rubbish of his predecessors, it will certainly raise a smile, for very much is bound to happen of which no hint is yet discoverable. And indeed, even in our generation, circumstances may well change so unexpectedly and so radically that this book may very soon look ridiculous. But no matter. We of today must conceive our relation to the rest of the universe as best we can. And even if our images must seem fantastic to future men, they may nonetheless serve their purpose today. Some readers, taking my story to be an attempt at prophecy, may deem it unwarrantably pessimistic. But it is not prophecy. It is myth, or an essay in myth. We all desire the future to turn out more happily than I have figured it. In particular, we desire our present civilization to advance steadily towards some kind of utopia. The thought that it may decay and collapse, and that all its spiritual treasure may be lost irrevocably, is repugnant to us. Yet this must be faced as at least a possibility. And this kind of tragedy, the tragedy of a race, must, I think, be admitted in any adequate myth.
And so, while gladly recognising that in our time there are strong seeds of hope as well as of despair, I have imagined for aesthetic purposes that our race will destroy itself. There is today a very earnest movement for peace and international unity, and surely with good fortune and intelligent management it may triumph. Most earnestly we must hope that it will. But I have figured things out in this book in such a manner that this great movement fails. I suppose it incapable of preventing a succession of national wars, and I permit it only to achieve the goal of unity and peace after the mentality of the race has been undermined. May this not happen. May the League of Nations, or some more strictly cosmopolitan authority, win through before it is too late. Yet let us find room in our minds and in our hearts for the thought that the whole enterprise of our race may be, after all, but a minor and unsuccessful episode in a vaster drama, which also perhaps may be tragic. Any attempt to conceive such a drama must take into account whatever contemporary science has to say about man's own nature and his physical environment. I have tried to supplement my own slight knowledge of natural science by pestering my scientific friends. In particular, I have been very greatly helped by a conversation with Professors P. G. H. Boswell, J. Johnston and J. Rice of Liverpool, but they must not be held responsible for the many deliberate extravagances which, though they serve a purpose in the design, may jar upon the scientific ear. To Dr. L. A. Reid, I am much indebted for general comments, and to Mr. E. V. Rue for many very valuable suggestions. To Professors and Mrs. L. C. Martin, who read the whole book in manuscript, I cannot properly express my gratitude for constant encouragement and criticism. To my wife's devastating sanity, I owe far more than she supposes. Before closing this preface, I would remind the reader that throughout the following pages, the speaker... The first person singular is supposed to be not the actual writer, but an individual living in the extremely distant future. W.O.S. West Kirby, July 1930.